Okay, how do I want to start here? So first thing I ask you to do, draw three non-collinear points. So one, two, three, right? Non-collinear means in a straight line? No, non-collinear means not in a straight line, right? So we basically want to make a triangle. Would this be okay? Yeah, so there's my three non-collinear points. Then what? Label them A, B, C. Does it matter which one goes where? No. no. Now, depending on how I label them, my picture is going to look different than your picture, right? Uh, at least the overall essence of the picture. Um, so I'll go A and B and C. That's how I'm going to label mine. All right, what next? I want to use those points to draw three things. What's the first thing I want to draw? Chris? Line A, B. So what do I do? Just go from A to B like that? No, I don't want to do that, right? What do I want to do? Yeah, we want it to go all the way through. So even if, and, and this is something that I see a lot, and don't do this, I'm showing you the wrong way to do it. Even if you put arrows there, that's kind of uh, a mixed meaning there. Because by ending the line at the point, it shows that it stops. But then by putting the arrow, it keeps going. Um, and, and that's just mixed signals, and we don't like to do that. So we want to draw this so it goes all the way through the two points, A and B. And then what else do I need to do to show that it's a line? Chris? Yeah, exactly. We'll put arrows on there to show that it goes on forever in both of those directions. All right, so there's line A, B. All right, what, what next? Ray B C. So how am I gonna do that? So like that. No. What? No. What did I do wrong there? B is the end point. Okay, good. So B is the end point. So we need to make sure that we draw it so that the line stops or starts at B and then goes all the way through C. All right, so since it's ray B, C, we know it starts at B and then goes from there through point C. Uh, okay, and the last one? Somebody else? Okay, good. So starting at A, stopping at C, uh, that would be line segment A, C. So... To, to just kind of check to make sure that your drawing is correct. Uh, the first one, line A, B, it should extend through points A and B and have arrows at the end. For ray B, C, it should not extend beyond point B, but it should extend beyond point C and have an arrow at the end. And then for segment A, C, you should have a line segment that starts at A and stops at C, or you could look at it the other way, starts at C and stops at A. So you should have something that looks like this. It might be rotated or flipped or uh, distorted a little bit, but it should have the same idea. All right, you guys okay with that? It's pretty easy, right? Okay, um, so we're actually going to start a new topic today. We spent a couple of days on building blocks. Uh, we will be taking an assessment on those on Tuesday along with um, the other two topics we've done, which is inductive reasoning and... What do we do after inductive reasoning? Symmetry. Symmetry. So the assessment that we're going to take on uh, Tuesday next week will be inductive reasoning, symmetry, and building blocks of geometry, which will be topics on points, lines, planes, um, and that stuff. I will spend a little bit of time tomorrow going over the worksheet that I gave you yesterday um, to make sure that we're all on the same page and you know what you're doing with that. Okay? Any questions about that stuff? All right, let's move on then. Um, oh, hey, there's the opener again. Okay, so we're going to do some terminology here. Um, for, for each term that we talk about, I want you to draw a picture uh, and write a description of the term that we are talking about so that you can go back, look at your notes, and, and know what it is. Um, the first one... 
is, is just kind of a, it, it's a background term that we need to know. We're going to start talking about parallel lines and a little bit about perpendicular lines. We, we mentioned yesterday the idea of parallel lines, and those are lines that what? What, what property do parallel lines have? Terrence? Okay, they run alongside each other. They don't necessarily have to be next to each other. They can be really far, right? Uh, and what else? What what makes them parallel? See? They never, um, they, they never come okay, they never intersect, right? So parallel lines are lines that are in the same plane that never intersect. You guys remember what it was when we have lines that are in different planes that never intersect? Skew. Skew. That was the term that I talked about yesterday. Um, so parallel lines are lines that are in the same plane, they run alongside each other and never intersect. Are there any lines up here that are parallel to each other? Yeah. No. Uh, even though these two lines right here, this line and this line don't intersect, um, sorry, this line and this line don't intersect, oh my arrow got stuck, um, they're not parallel because eventually they will. I could extend them um, and they would intersect. and I. They wouldn't really intersect on the page, so I might, you know, uh, bend it a little bit. But you can see that they'll, they'll eventually intersect at some point. Um, so this, this term that we're going to use here doesn't necessarily deal with parallel lines, but it's more um, an introduction to parallel lines and a term we will use with parallel lines. Uh, so that line right there, and this refers to any line that crosses or intersects two other lines, is, is kind of a go-between line. We're going to look at relationships uh, of the angles at this intersection, at this intersection. You know what it's called, Chris? Oh, no, I'm asking a question. What's up? Yeah, yes. So that go-between line, the line that intersects the two other lines, that line is called a transversal. Do we draw the two lines that open the same? Yep. Oh. Might be a good idea to write that down too. A transversal is a line that intersects two other lines. Here are two pictures of um, of lines, pairs of lines that have special relationships. Um, as they're drawn, we don't necessarily know if they have the relationships, but I think you guys know what they are. Um, what relationship do these two lines have? Parallel. Now, I just said, as they're drawn, we don't know for sure that they have the relationship. Why, why do we not know for sure that they're parallel? Because they, they, they don't continue on. Yeah, they don't continue on. They don't continue far enough to see if they're actually going to get closer together or not. Um, we could take some measurements that would tell us if they're parallel. Um, or, does anybody know how we could mark parallel lines in a drawing to show that they're parallel? No? So what we're going to do to show that lines are parallel in the problems that we work is we're going to put a little arrow on each of those lines, and that tells us that those two lines are parallel to each other. Yes, draw the picture. Yeah. The other, uh, the other thing you need to know about this, if... If we already have a set of parallel lines and we want to draw another set of parallel lines, we don't want to use the same symbol. So we could use a double arrow if we needed to, or a triple arrow. Um, and if really necessary, we could start putting some other symbols on there, but the arrows are, are better. Um, so we use the arrows to show that the lines are parallel. Um, and we don't want to assume that they're parallel. Uh, we don't want to make assumptions, just like I was talking about with the collinear points. We don't assume that any three or more points are collinear unless there's a line going through them. Same thing here with the parallel lines. We don't assume they're parallel. Um, we base it on how they're marked, and so we mark them with those arrows to show they are. Okay? Have you guys seen those arrows before? Okay. Um, what about these two lines? Those are intersecting lines, uh, but they intersect at a particular angle, which makes them what? Perpendicular. Okay, so those are perpendicular lines. Oh, there's a definition of parallel lines. Do you want to write that down? 
Uh, the other two are perpendicular lines. Uh, again, we don't want to assume. Does anybody know how you mark two lines to show they're perpendicular? I think you know this one. Chris? Draw, draw and make a box on the corner. Exactly. Make a little box on the corner like that, uh, and that shows that they're perpendicular. It also indicates that that is a right angle. Um, depending on how you define perpendicular and right angles, they, they mean the same thing, but they might be defined differently, but uh, we use the same mark for both. Not only do they create right angles when they intersect, but they also create four angles, and all four of those angles are... They're all 90-degree angles, and they all have the same measure. So they create four congruent angles. Um, we could say it that way, or they create four right angles. Um, so in this case, I'll define it as two lines that intersect at right angles, or 90-degree angles. This stuff's all review right now, isn't it? No. No? Yeah? yeah? Uh, this thing is new, though. Okay. All right, so we've got our transversal. Um, in order to, to communicate about what we're doing, we're going, to, uh, we're going to take this transversal, which intersects each of these two lines, and creates how many angles? How many angles do we have right here? Four, and how many angles here? Four. Four. So just for, some, for communication purposes, we're going to number all of those angles, um, so in this particular picture, we'll number, number them as I have right there. They might be numbered differently in a different picture. Um, but this is a picture that you'll probably want to draw. Uh, I think I left some space in the bottom right on the back there, like underneath where it says alternate um, interior angles. Draw this picture down there. <coughs> All right, so among those eight angles that are formed, Four of them are called interior angles. Anybody want to guess which four are the interior angles? Uh, three, four, five, six. Three, four, five, and six. So those four angles we call interior angles because why? They're inside the. Yeah, they're inside the two lines, right? So the the angles inside of the two lines are called interior angles. So what I would do, um, since you have the drawing now, is just write the numbers of the angles underneath interior angles so you know which ones they are. You can write a little short description if you want, but uh, I, th I think just saying which angles there are might be enough to jog your memory and, and know which ones. Yeah. Okay. How about exterior angles? Hopefully this is pretty easy. Which, which four do you think are going to be the exterior, Chris? Yeah, so the angles outside of the lines are going to be the exterior angles, so those will be 1, 2, 7, and 8. I think those names are pretty intuitive, aren't they? Okay, so now the more specific relationships that we're going to look at. Uh, corresponding angles. So... All of the rest of the relationships we're going to look at are going to be pairs of angles. We're going to look at one angle and another angle um, together. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one angle from this group, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and one angle from this group, 5, 6, 7, 8, and we're going to give that relationship a name. One of those relationships is called corresponding angles. Anyone want to guess what a pair of corresponding angles here would be? 1 and 8. 1 and 8. Why? Okay, that's true, um, but they're not going to be corresponding. They actually have a different name. Uh, what do you think? One and five. One and five, why? Um, because they're both on the outside, or I don't know. Well, one's on the outside, five's on the inside, right? Yeah. So you still think one and five? Yeah. Yeah? Why? I don't know, because basically it's like the same. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say, isn't it? Okay, how many people think that 1 and 5 might be corresponding angles? Okay, I agree with that. 1 and 5 are corresponding angles. 1 and 5 are corresponding angles because they're in the same position at their respective intersections. So 
one is top left, five is top left. So you could say the same position or same orientation. Um, so one and five are corresponding angles. What other pair of angles would be corresponding? Two and six. How about another one? Terrence? Uh, three, and seven. three and seven. How about another one? Four and eight. Four and eight. Good. So there are four different sets of corresponding angles, and I would, I would list all of them. Um, so one of the examples we had was two and six. Um, but there are four of them. So one and five are corresponding, two and six are corresponding, three and seven are corresponding, and four and eight are corresponding. Okay? All right. Next term. Same side interior angles. This is a name that is pretty descriptive, and I think you could probably guess what they are. So does somebody give me a pair that you think would be same side interior. Three and five. Three and five. What do you guys think? Three and five, same side interior? Yay or nay? Yay, yes. Y nay, yes. 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 Okay, I agree also. Three and five are same side. Uh, same side interior. So when I, when I say same side, what am I referring to? Same side of the, which is called the transversal, yes. So when we say same side, and later on when we say alternate, we're referring to positions along the transversal. So 3 and 5 are both on the same side of the transversal, and they're both interior angles. So they would be same side interior angles. Um, 4 and... Six would also be same side interior angles. Terrence? Well, okay, one and seven, they are on the same side of the transversal, but are they interior angles? They're exterior, right? So the next one, same side exterior angles, would be what? Give me an example, Terrence. One and seven, exactly. Uh, one and seven would be same side exterior, or two and eight. That makes sense? You guys keeping up? So we've got two more relationships we need to talk about. Uh, alternate interior. What does alternate mean? Different, right? Um, to alternate is to go back and forth. So alternate sides of the transversal would be opposite sides. So who can tell me which angle is alternate interior to angle 6? Um, got all kinds of volunteers. Cheney, go. Three. You guys agree with that? Yeah. So six and three are both <clears throat> interior angles, um, and they're on alternate or opposite sides of the transversal, so they're alternate interior angles. We, we could also use the term opposite interior angles, uh, if you would like. All right, and then what would be the other set of alternate interior angles? Chris? Five and four. Five and four, yep. So four and five are opposite sides of the transversal and interior angles. Okay, one more. Alternate exterior angles. Give me some alternate exterior angles. One and eight. One and eight. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, yeah I do too. So 1 and 8 are on opposite sides of the transversal, and they're both exterior angles. And then the other set of alternate exterior, 2 and 7. Okay. Kind of jumped the gun there. Isn't it like the loop Euclidean? Yeah, it's, it's named after him. It's called Euclidean geometry. Um, so I've talked a little bit about Euclidean geometry, and I've talked a little bit about what he did. Um, Euclid was special because he was the first mathematician to really formalize math and, and to kind of write a textbook uh, and to use the idea of proofs. And basically the way Euclid set up his geometry was he said, okay, there's these five things that we, we just assume are true. Uh, there are things that we can't really prove to true because they're so simple, there's no way to break it down and, and really prove it. And he called those axioms. Uh, these are Euclid's five axioms, and, and everything he did in geometry was based on these five axioms. Now, of course, he had to define things. He had to make a definition for uh, what uh, 
what a right angle is and uh, what a circle is and all that kind of stuff. Um, but these are the things, the properties in geometry that he said, we're just going to assume these are true. So let's go through these and talk about what he means. This is kind of written in old language, uh, and so it can get a little bit confusing. Uh, the first one says to draw a straight line from any point to any point. So what he's saying there is if you have two points, you can draw a line. And when he says a straight line, he's actually referring to what we call a line segment. Uh, you can draw a line segment from any one point to any other point. So if you're given two points, you can draw a line. That's pretty common sense, isn't it? Don't, that seems like something that we could, we could assume to be true. Um, and the idea of it being a straight line is important because if it's not a straight line, then we end up with pictures that look like this and we can draw more than one, right? So if we're given two points, he says we can draw a straight line, which means that it's going to be unique. Um, and I kind of missed them there. Let's fix that. Uh, so we get something like that. So Euclid's first axiom just says we can draw a line segment when we're given two points. All right. Second one, to produce a finite straight line, which is what we would call a line segment, continuously in a straight line. So he says that if we have this line segment, what can we do? Extend it. We can make it bigger. Um, and it's going to go off in some direction, but we can extend that finite line um, as much as we want. And this, this is kind of interesting. When Euclid was doing this, um, mathematicians hadn't really formalized the idea of infinity, so he didn't really say you can extend it forever, but it basically says you can extend it as much as you need to. So you can extend it, and then you can extend it some more if you need to, um, but he never really said you can extend it forever because that was kind of a, a deep concept for them. Uh, and it's still a pretty difficult concept for us. But it's the same idea of turning a line segment into... What do you do if you take line segment you extend it forever? A line. So not only with two points can you draw a line segment, but you can also draw a line through them. Okay, the third one, to describe a circle with any center and distance. Uh, you guys know what a circle is, right? Yeah. So he says that uh, if I tell you where the center is, that's this part, and I tell you what the distance is, what, what do you think he's referring to when he says distance for a circle? Diameter. Close? Radius. Radius. So if I give you any center and if I give you any radius, you can create a circle. So if I tell you that, the center of the circle is going to be right here, and that this, the length of this line segment is going to be the radius, then I can use that to draw myself a circle. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. Pretty simple? Okay, um, moving on then. Um, that all right angles are equal to one another. So this, uh, he defined right angles in a different way than we would uh, they didn't measure angles in degrees. Um, the way they measured right angles is kind of what I was talking about earlier with perpendicular lines, where four right angles make a full circle. Um, so he says that all right angles are going to be equal to one another. So if you have a right angle over here, let me go ahead and draw it. Uh, let's say we have a right angle right there. That looks like about a right angle, doesn't it? And I have another right angle right here. That looks like another right angle, right? Uh, when he says they're equal to one another, he's basically saying that he could take this right angle and flip it over on top of this right angle and they would match up. Makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, so those first four are pretty simple. Can I have somebody read the fifth one for me? Chris? Oh, I thought you were pointing to yourself. Steven? Go ahead. If a straight line. Oh, you already messed it up. First of all, this is called the parallel postulate. Crystal clear, right? Yeah, I had to read that about 17 times before I started making any sense of it. Um, the, 
here's the weird thing about Euclid's geometry. He had five axioms that all of his geometry is based on. And actually, the first half of it uh, didn't even use this parallel postulate. It, it didn't come in until uh, pretty late. Uh, the first four are all really simple ideas. The fifth one, not so much. Um, not only is it uh, a lot longer and a lot harder to read and kind of hard to break down, but it's just not a simple idea. So let's, let's try to look at what he's saying here. Uh, because these axioms are what Euclid is saying. These are the simplest things in geometry that we can't prove. Um, and we're going to base everything on that. And if, if we're starting with something that's not so simple and not very obvious, then uh, we might run into some trouble later on because we're assuming that this is going to be true. And, you know, bad things might happen if it's not. So, he says that if a straight line falling on two straight lines make the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles. Let's start with that. Um, so, a straight line falling on two straight lines. Well, we just define that, right? Here's a straight line right here. It is falling or intersecting on these two straight lines. So what do we call this line right here? What are we going to call it? A transversal. Okay, so we can already simplify his language and just say if there's a transversal crossing two lines. Um, make the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles. Well, interior angles on the same side, those are just what kind of angles? Same side interior angles. So if we have a transversal that makes same side interior angles less than two right angles, what do two right angles add up to? 180. So if same side interior angles are less than 180, the two straight lines, okay, these are the two straight lines, if we extend them forever, indefinitely, so as far as we need to, if we extend them and they meet, sorry, so if we extend them and they meet, then, what does that mean about these two angles right here? Sorry, we already know that. If these two are less than 180, then that means that these two are going to meet. That's basically all it's saying. So, if same side interior angles are less than 180, then the lines are going to intersect on that side. That's what Euclid's fifth axiom says. So less than two right angles. You guys know any? You, you guys know your Greek alphabet? No. No, you didn't have to learn that in like your Greek class in grade school. I'm I'm just kidding. There's probably not a Greek class in grade school anywhere around here. Um, this letter right here is the Greek letter rep, um, corresponding to our A. That's an alpha. Uh, this is corresponds to our B, which is beta. Uh, this is delta. And this is gamma. Uh, usually when we're measuring angles um, as a variable, instead of using um, our, our alphabet, we'll use the Greek alphabet to represent angles. Um, so alpha and beta in this case are two angles that are going to add up to less than 180 degrees. All right. And, and then what Euclid's saying is since alpha and beta are less than 180 degrees, then I know those two lines are going to intersect on the same side as alpha and beta. So we're going to get a little collision there. Isn't that what like sorority uses? Like yes. Fraternities and sororities in college use the Greek alphabet to name them. Yep. Um, okay, and the same thing's true on the other side. In this case, gamma and delta add up to less than 180 degrees. Um, so that means that um, what's going to happen? Are the lines going to intersect on the same side of alpha and beta or gamma and delta? Oh, come on, it's not that complicated. Are they going to intersect over here on this side or are they going to intersect over here on this side when these two angles add up to less than 180? Left or right? Left. The left, right? Correct. So there, if we extend them indefinitely, sorry, uh, or at least as far as we need to, then they will intersect each other on that side. All right? So what the parallel postulate really says, and this is why it's called the parallel postulate, because we haven't had parallel lines yet, right? If they don't add up to less than 180, which means that they add up to exactly 180, then what's going to happen? They won't intersect. So um, we're actually doing the converse here, which is a little bit... Um, 
well, a little bit nebulous as far as this goes. But basically what it's saying is if, if the two angles here, uh, alpha and beta, add up to exactly 180, which is going to mean that gamma and delta also add up to exactly 180, the lines are not going to intersect, and so the parallel... I just gave away what I was going to say. The lines are going to be parallel, exactly. And that's why we call it the parallel postulate. All right, so um, I've got some fancy animations here that says alpha plus beta equals 180, which means that uh, gamma plus delta equals 180. Uh, and so that if I extend these lines as far as I want, uh, no matter how far I extend them, they're still not going to intersect. Cool? Now... The reason this is on a white slide is because you really don't need to know all that. I just like talking about it. I think it's fun. Okay. Um, to make it simpler, um, I, I kind of went through how we could simplify that, that expression, the parallel postulate. Um, basically, it says if same side interior angles are not supplementary, what does supplementary mean? Angles that add up to 180. Yep. Um, that's a term that we'll talk about in a second, then the lines will intersect and they're not parallel. Okay, so in layman's terms, if two lines are parallel, then same side interior angles are supplementary. And that's what you want to write down. If you wrote something else down, just cross it off and write the new stuff. Uh, and I would recommend just drawing a picture. You don't have to number those angles, but draw a picture to show which angles are the same side interior angles. When we write definitions, Give me one second, Terrence. When we write definitions in here, we're going to write them in a form called uh, biconditional. Um, and a biconditional is a sentence in this form that has if and only if in there. Uh, we will be talking more about conditionals and biconditionals. Um, next week we'll get to it. But I just I want to kind of introduce you to the format. So what this definition says is two angles are supplementary if and only if the sum of their measures is... And you need to finish that sentence for me? 180. What the definition says is that two angles are supplementary if and only if, and the if and only if symbol looks like this. You don't need to write this down, but by looking at it like this, um, it, I think it's easier to see what the biconditional means. Uh, the sum of the angles is 180. First of all, what does sum mean? You're adding them together, right? So it's the answer to an addition problem. All right. So this definition is a biconditional because it, it works both ways. What the definition says is that if I tell you the two angles are supplementary, then you can conclude, you can uh, tell me that the two angles add up to 180. Or, the other way around, if I told you that two angles add up to 180, then you could tell me that they're supplementary. So, either one of these implies that the other is also true. If you know the sum is 180, then you know they're supplementary. If you know they're supplementary, then the sum is 180. So, when we write definitions, we're going to write it so that it works both ways. We don't want something, and there are a lot of things in, in geometry that only work one way. Uh, we don't want to write a definition or define a term that only works one way. That when, when we have the term, then the definition is true, but when the definition is, definition is true, then it's not necessarily that term. Uh, because those kinds of definitions are not really useful. A lot of the theorems that we'll do in here will be one direction, though. They'll be a, a conditional, not a biconditional. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about that, as I said, next week. Um, any questions about what supplementary angles are?